Or Sergeant, will you please start your recordings? Recording to the computer, all set. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the New York City Council Remote Parent on Veterans, jointly with the Committee on Aging. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Buenos dias, everyone. My name is Councilmember Chaim Deitch, Chair on, of the Committee on Veterans, and I would like to welcome everyone to today's virtual joint hearing on supporting the city's aging veterans, held by the New York City Council's Committee on Veterans and the Committee on Aging. I would like to acknowledge my colleague, Councilmember Margaret Chin, the Chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Aging. I would also like to thank the Department of Veterans Services, as well as the Department for the Aging, for attending today's hearing. It has been a trying time as the city reckons with and works to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Aside from the deaths and illness caused by COVID-19, this past year has led to economic hardship and isolation for many, as we collectively struggle with a global public health crisis, the likes of which has not been observed any of our lifetimes. While much remains that we do not know about the virus, we do know that COVID-19 disproportionately affects older individuals, and that's that veteran experience higher rates of social, physical, mental, and health ailments. As such, veterans, and particularly aging veterans, are a demographic that will likely need additional support and services. Since the majority of the city's estimated 200,000 veterans are seniors who are nearing senior age, this hearing has been convened in order to specifically consider and analyze the unique needs and characteristics of the city's aging veterans. In particular, the committee, the committee's hope to learn more about the city's suit of services targeted to towards older veterans, how older veterans can and do receive assistance from city agencies when they need it. The extent of collaboration between the Department for Veteran Services and the Department for Aging and ident identify any gaps in services needed for this demographic. As more of these programs are moved online, we want to ensure that older veterans have proper and adequate access to the benefits that are owed and do not face unnecessary obstacles in receiving these benefits. There are also specific issues uh, issue areas affecting older veterans that the committee wants to discuss and hear about today. Research shows that housing affordability and homelessness continue to be an acute concern for aging veterans, as more than half of the veterans living in New York City's homeless shelters are older adults. Older military veterans also have a high level of need in relation to physical and mental well being, and the increased isolation brought on by the pandemic is likely to exaggerate these issues. Finally, we want to learn from DVS and DIFTA, as well as members of the public who have signed up to testify, any other outstanding issues that remain and are not being fully addressed in regards to the aging veterans population here in New York City. <laughs> to that end, today we'll be hearing intro 1616-2019, sponsored by Council Member Paul Ballone, Intro 1616 would add additional requirements to DVS annuals report about the number of seniors DVS serves, and as well as the number of, inqu of inquiries received by DVS from veterans regarding specific programs. So I would also, I would like to acknowledge and welcome my colleagues uh, who have joined us here, and I'd like to acknowledge um, Alika Amprey Samuel, whose husband is a veteran, Councilmember Ruben Diaz, Councilmember Deanne Ayala, Councilmember Matthew Eugene, Councilmember Alan Maisel. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed anyone. Let me take a look. Uh, I think I got everyone. And uh, I'd also like to thank my staff, Joe Bello, my Director of Veterans Affairs. And I'd also like to thank uh, Central staff who helped me prepare for this hearing, Nuzat 
uh, Bianca, Kalima, and, and Thomas. And finally, I would uh, especially like to thank the Committee on Aging, Chair Margaret Chin, and all of the staff for collaborating and working with us to prepare this hearing today. Um, we're going to be hearing testimony first from uh, some of the CBOs um, in regards to uh, what challenges they have regarding uh, our um, aging veteran community uh, before we hear from our um, administration. So um, I'd like to ask the council to uh, administer the oath. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. My name is Bianca Vitali, and I'm counsel. Oh, yeah. Good morning. Um, Should I? Uh, I'm sorry, counsel. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I think we went a little bit off script here. Yes, I think yes. That, um, this was, I was just Chair testing Mark, you out. Chair Chin yeah. is going to give some opening remarks. So, yeah, right? yeah. So I'm. <laughs> no worries. I was like, uh, okay, we'll jump right into it. I didn't realize. Testing you out. Yeah. Just testing you out. You can turn it over to Chair Chin for opening remarks. So I, I, I'd like to. to one second. Can I introduce my colleague? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Okay. We're not going to administer the oath to you, uh, Margaret. <laughs> Yes. So I, I would like to introduce my colleague, very vocal in, in, uh, in the city council, and please don't overshadow me. Um, and this is a very relaxed hearing, uh, no controversy. You know, so I, with, I, with, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Councilmember Margaret Chen. Good morning, Chair Deutsch. Look, when we have the aging committee, it's always very lively but cordial, right? Always, always. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and I would like to welcome you to today's joint oversight hearing on supporting New York City's aging veteran population. I'd like to thank Chair Deutsch for co chairing this important hearing with me. During today's hearing, we will be discussing a population within our aging committee that does not get talked about enough senior veterans. According to the Department of Veteran Service, DVS, there are over 150,000 veterans living in New York City. And of those veterans, about one third served in the Vietnam War. About 17% served between 1990 and 2001. This means that about 72% of the city's veterans are age 55 or older. This is not an insignificant population. Just as all of our seniors have unique needs, senior veterans have also had unique challenges related to their experience as veterans. This population tend to experience higher rate of social, physical, mental, and health ailments. Because of their service and experience, for example, senior veterans often suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. The older these veterans get, the more likely it's for their PTSD to re-emerge. Often, this is because they have retired and no longer have distractions to occupy their time or because they have more medical problems um, the older they get, which trigger their PTSD. Senior veterans also tend to have higher rates of disability due to injuries from services, from their service. Perhaps because of all this, senior veterans have lower workforce participation rates and often they live on very limited means, relying on social security and Medicare. In fact, over half of the veterans living in homeless shelters are older adults. This is a population that needs special attention, but rarely gets any. In fact, it does not seem the city even served this population specifically. Although, although DVS and DIFTA have plenty of programs to serve all veterans and all seniors, it is not clear whether they have any programming, resources, or initiative that specifically look at senior veterans. It is also not clear what data the agency collect on senior veterans and their needs 
or how the agency worked together to serve them. At this hearing, we want to hear from our senior veterans and senior veterans organization. We want to know what challenges senior veterans are facing. What has been their unique needs during this pandemic? What services have they been using and what services have been unhelpful to them during this time? And from DVS and DIFTA, we want more information. We want to know how you are serving older veterans, what programs and resources you are offering them, and how your agencies communicate and are working together to make sure no senior veterans falls through the cracks. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing, our council, NUSA, Chidori, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Coop, finance unit head, Johini Sapora, and my director of legislation, uh, Kana Irvin. And I'd like to thank the other members uh, of the committee for joining us today. And uh, now I will turn it back to Chair Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Very well said. Uh, I will now ask our committee counsel, Bianca Vitali, to go over some procedural items. Perfect. We did great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. My name is Bianca Vitali, and I am counsel to the Committee on Veterans for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of, del of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from local veterans organizations, followed by council member um, questions. Then we'll, after the first panel, we will hear from the administrative, um, administration's representatives, followed by council member questions, and then the remaining panelists um, will give some testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hands. I will now call on the first panel. Testimony will be provided by Ashton Stewart, Joe Vitti, Peter Kempner, Coco Kulhane. I would like to now welcome Ashton Stewart to testify. After Mr. Stewart, I will be calling on Joe Vitti, Peter Kempner, and then Coco Calhoun to testify. Ashton Stewart. Good morning. Thank you so much um, for having this hearing today and for inviting Sage and Sage Rest to participate. Um, Chair Deutsch, happy belated birthday to you, sir. Thank you, um, sir. And uh, very nice to meet you, Chair Chin. Um, Don't be about my age, thank you. Um, de definitely no, won't, I'll respect that. Um, Sage Vets is a New York State program um, for older LGBT veterans and that started in 2014 and I've been the program manager since May of 2018. We're profoundly grateful for the support from the City Council um, and uh, the Committee on Veterans uh, for helping us raise our uh, profile here and get a little bit more work done. Um, speaking of access issues, I just want to start out with a top issue that's a federal issue the National Records Center, uh, where we get all of the uh, personnel files um, from a military member's service has been closed since March, 2020. The only thing that they're providing are DD-214s, which most often we don't need. We need the records to show um, a history of disability compensation claims, um, everything, um, you name it. The only thing that we've been able to do is uh, help out veterans who already have a lot of this information already. So that is priority number one. I know, you know the New York State Division of Veterans Services has made it their federal priority as well. Hopefully that will change soon. But in the meantime, we've been keeping ourselves very active and very busy. Um, the access to these uh, benefits is a problem, but New York State is taking a leadership and recognizing the fact that a lot of older LGBT veterans served during the time when it was pre Don't Ask, Don't Tell, when they still had anti-LGBT policies. A lot of them were discharged with OTH discharges, and that itself is a barrier to services and access to um, um, military benefits. So um, the Restoration of Honor Act uh, was signed by the governor, Governor Cuomo last November. 
we were involved with some of uh, some of that buildup. Um, we worked with Senator, um, excuse me, uh, Senator Brad Hoyleman, who was the original bill sponsor and assembly member T.D. Barrett to help with some language because a lot of these veterans who were discharged for the sexual orientation, it was a secondary issue why they were discharged. So we helped encourage the legislature to include PTSD, TBI, and MST, along with sexual orientation and gender identity in this legislation. It's huge. This bill is getting so much traction. It's got legs. New York State is serving as a model for other states. I can tell you Colorado is about to sign a similar bill. California model, modeled their legislation after our legislation, which is in committee at the moment, AB 325. Illinois State reached out to us through D.D. Barrett's office asking for more information about crafting similar legislation. New Jersey has a bill. And I know this because I am part of the Delaware Valley Veterans Consortium, and I'm always talking about Restoration of Honor Act and how it's making a significant change and improvement to people's lives. We had our first uh, meritorious application uh, last year with Lewis Miller, who not only has access to New York State veteran benefits now, but he also has validation for the discharge for being gay was wrong. They, the state of New York has acknowledged that, um, and we're trying to get him help uh, to get that discharge change at the federal level. All of this is a culmination to put pressure on the federal government to make the change at that level, which would take care of all of this nonsense. Um, and there is a bill that was put together by Gillibrand and Schatz called the Restore Honor to Service Members Act. So all of this work hopefully will result in something positive in the near future. And we're also always uncovering situations that a lot of providers aren't aware of for older LGBT veterans. Uh, one such experience was a veteran who was discharged for being gay with an honorable discharge, um, was five months shy of completing the two-year requirements for access to health care after the end of his service. Um, and because he was kicked out for being gay, we're working with some providers to try to change the policy of the VA for cases such as his. Um, he would benefit significantly from getting some health care at a veteran's establishment, like the VA, who understand the veteran experience. And we have not been able to help them with that so far because of the, this two-year requirement. Um, and we couldn't do this without the support of the council. Um, so I just want to thank you so much. I can go on and on about the Restoration of Honor Act. I think you get the idea, but I'd be happy to add context or answer any questions should there be any. And I submitted my testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashton. I'd like to hear more. So maybe we'll come over to my house for a barbecue. When I... OK, I would love to. <laughs> be honored. <laughs> Next, I would like to call up, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I would like to call on Joe Vitti, and we'll definitely have a period for um, questions and answers. So after this first panel, um, the chairs will definitely have um, a period of questions to ask. Okay, great. Joe Vitti, you're up next. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Deutsch, Chair Chin, and members of the New York City Council Committee on Veterans and Community of Aging. My name is Joe Vitti. I'm the Director of Visitor Service of New York's Veterans Program. I'm also a post-911 veteran who served in the U.S. Army as a military intelligence officer. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify about the hospice and home care services that the Visitor Nurse Service of New York provides to our Asian veteran population. As the nation's largest not-for-profit home and community-based care organization in the U.S. for approximately 40,000 clients and patients, Venus and Y has always been there for New York throughout many of its biggest public health and natural emergencies, include, including COVID-19. Since March of 2020, Venus and Y has cared for more than 6,000 COVID positive New Yorkers throughout the five boroughs. There are approximately 140,000 veterans in New York City today, 71% of, of whom are older than 55 years old. Due to the health complexities of vets and the complexities of the VA healthcare system and the systemic poor health literacy among veterans, many veterans never fully access or utilize the benefits that they need. As New York City's veterans population continues to age, it is becoming even more important to make these services available at, as well as provide community outreach so that they know about their full VA benefits and community health organizations within their, within their own communities and neighborhoods. Venus and Y is the is the hot, Venus and Y Hospice is the largest home care and hospice provider to veterans in New York State. Our hospice veterans program is a level five that was awarded by 
the uh, Federal VA Health Administration and the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization as being a leader that, empower, that empowers ho hospice providers and professionals to meet the unique needs of veterans during end of life care. And our veterans home health care program tailors our high quality home care needs to the particular attention of veterans. Together, our two departments in hospice and home care have provided veteran have provided care in the comforts of their own home, in their own homes to 1,580 veterans in 2020 alone. <clears throat> uh, in our testimony, we have our stats broken down by war era and their and their locations per uh, per per borough. So please refer to that. Um, on on average, our veterans uh, our veterans have have eight to ten chronic and terminal conditions in contrast with our general patient population that has three to four. Veterans' top three conditions in hospice are heart, heart failure, COPD, and cancer. In our home care, it's surgical recoveries, medication management, and cancer as well. Both programs provide veterans and their families with, with a skilled veteran liaison who assists them with accessing the many benefits and services available. Our staff, our staff is diverse in ethnicity, gender, type of military service, which helps us bring culturally competent care when addressing veterans issues. We've continued to provide this care throughout COVID-19, both in person and through telehealth outreach and have conducted virtual events to it in order to engage with community organization and veteran service organizations throughout. We also work with New York City Department of Veteran Services and social service programs to coordinate additional care benefits such as Meals on Wheels types, type of services. We welcome these opportunities to grow and collaborate with DVS. Um, in a recent example of how we assist our veterans, uh, we, we recently had the privilege of a veteran who had, been who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He and his wife had no family or friends support and, and the wife was uh, needed uh, additional help taking care of him that our home care could no longer address due to the complexity and the advanced and how advanced his cancer was. Uh, so due to his decline in health, we connected him to the VA healthcare system, which assigned him to a primary care physician and gave him additional personal care hours through the VA home-based primary care program. Um, and we also helped him secure copies of his discharge papers and correct his social security number that he had forged when he was younger in order to enlist early. Uh, he was then admitted to our hospice program where he and his wife received ongoing compassionate support from our expert hospice team. And he passed away peacefully this, uh, passed away peacefully this past February, the comfort of, of his own home. His wife, if you refer to our testimony, uh, wrote a very thankful and grateful letter to, to, to us as well. So Venus and Wise Veterans Program's mission is to improve the lives of veterans with unmet health care needs. Uh, uh, without access to needed support, veterans are at a greater risk for poor health outcomes. This important initiative has allowed us to engage veterans in discussions about their health goals while providing support, guidance, and linkage to appropriate services, benefits, and entitlements. I want to thank you all today for this opportunity to testify, and I'm available to address any further questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Yes. Beattie. I'm now going to call on Peter Kempner to give testimony. Yeah, I'd like to, um, should, we, should we go to uh, Councilman Vallone just to give his... Uh... Oh, yes, so sorry. I don't, um, I don't, I'm not sure that Councilmember Vallone is going to give opening remarks. I mean, uh, um, remarks, or is he? Give me one second, Chair. Sorry, I didn't, um, we didn't account for him giving remarks about the legislation. Hold on one second. You know, Chair, can we just uh, finish this first panel? Because I yeah, posed sure. questions to staff. Let's just finish up the okay, testimony of the right. first panel. And then um, if we have to stop questions and answers to uh, you know, to turn it over to Council Member Vallone, then we'll pivot. But let's just, uh, Peter Kempner, you may begin. Thank you, Council. Good morning. My name is Peter Kempner, and I'm the legal director at Volunteers of Legal Service, also known as VALS, where I supervise our Veterans Initiative, uh, which is part of our elderly project. Uh, thank you, Chair Chin and Chair Joich, for holding this hearing 
uh, that lies exactly in the intersection of uh, the populations that we serve in our veterans initiative. Uh, prior to uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, we were able to see clients in person at the Manhattan VA hospital, but unfortunately that's no longer an option for us. And so we have moved our services online and over the phone to be able to serve elderly veterans in New York City. And the core of the work that we do at the Veterans Initiative is to draft uh, and execute life planning documents uh, for older veterans, which includes last wills and testaments, powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, living wills, and other advanced directives. As we all know, the COVID-19 crisis has truly ravaged our veteran community. Uh, in January 2021, it was determined that more veterans had died from COVID-19 than in both the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts combined. Uh, and, and in looking at who passed away from COVID-19 amongst the veteran population, it was shown that more than half of those uh, who had passed away were age 50 and over. Um, and so truly the senior veterans are, are at, most, at, at the most risk. And lo locally, we've also seen a devastating impact of, of the pandemic on our seniors um, who have suffered 80% of COVID related deaths in New York City. And in, in our minds, uh, this crisis has only reinforced the urgency and the importance of planning for disability and for end of life. Sadly, too few seniors have properly planned for the future. And we know that the New York City veteran community is a graying one. Uh, these veterans need uh, to, to be able to plan so they're able to age in the community with dignity and with respect. Sadly, um, studies have shown that veterans like the population at large have not engaged in proper life planning. Uh, for example, a 2015 study showed that more than half of veterans lacked advanced directives, and a 2017 study showed that of, of 2,500 veterans being treated for cancer, 81% did not have any advanced directives in place. And we know that also in the New York City veteran community uh, are disproportionately people of color. And, and, and it has also been shown that people of color are less likely to engage in advanced care planning. Many of the low income older veterans that we serve think that they don't need to have advanced directives in place uh, because they don't have the resources or the wealth to pass on to the next generation. And frankly, they're wrong about this. By engaging in effective life planning, elderly and disabled veterans are more likely to stay in their homes uh, where they could age in place with dignity and respect. For example, a veteran who has executed a power of attorney empowers their agent to be able to seek government benefits, to pay for housing costs, uh, to sign renewal leases, to apply for and recertify for housing subsidies, and to deal with any issues that might arise with their landlord or with their housing provider. Landlords and market forces, as we know, are increasingly pushing long-term tenants from their housing and so taking any action to stabilize housing for veterans is more urgent than ever. H healthcare proxies allow caregivers to make critical uh, medical decisions and seek appropriate care for the veterans who entrusted them with this agency. And without these tools in place, older veterans might find themselves in a nursing home, which in New York City costs an average of $150,000 per year. Veterans on Medicaid and Medicare who live in their homes will save taxpayers approximately $1,600 per month. Effective life planning can also enable uh, or also keep disabled and elderly veterans from falling into guardianship and other government involvement. Veterans should be given the opportunity to choose someone that they trust to handle their affairs. And guardianships also could be very costly to public coffers due to legal fees, court examiners, and the involvement of adult protective services. Our hope is that the oversight being co conducted today by your two committees, the reporting re requirements that are outlined in intro 1616 will bring to light many of the issues that older veterans in New York City face. Cooperation between DVS and DIFTA is one key to meeting the needs of older veterans and we applaud the recognition of this intersectionality that is embodied in holding this joint hearing today. Thank you for allowing us to submit this testimony and supporting the needs of our older veterans.
Thank you so much, Mr. Kempner. Um, actually, right now we're going to turn it over to Councilmember Vallone to give some remarks on intro 1616 of 2018, and then we will finish our panel and open it up for uh, questions and answer period. So I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Vallone. There we go. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and to the panel that's up now, your words, honestly, as council members, when we hear support, advice, council, sage council such as yours, and then that becomes the bill that we're talking about and it grows with us, it makes everything that we've worked on over the last eight years worth it. So Peter, thank you for that. And bringing up the important issue about guardianships, because I might be one of the only attorneys in the world that actually handle guardianships in a past life and the difficulties that anyone, especially our seniors and our veterans, would have to navigate that world um, is, is tremendous that you brought it up. Uh, what I'd like to do is just with this quick moment, thank our great chairs, Chin and Deutsch. Um, Margaret and Haim have, have been stalwart leaders and have been an honor to work with them from day one, especially bringing uh, the bill 1616 to the floor today which quickly I would just want to say requires the Department of Veterans Services to include in its annual report data about the number of senior veterans DVS serves, as well as the number of inquiries received by DVS from veterans regarding social service programs, such as the SNAP and the New York State Veteran Property Tax Exemption, affordability housing programs, such as those run through the New York State Housing Authority and the New York Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, these data-driven bills, um, even at the last hearing, when we asked some of those critical questions, are, are still things that are missing. Uh, and as DVS has grown, we're excited to see it grow, but these are key components that not only the groups that are here today, but every veteran deserve to know uh, the numbers. And that's why this bill is so important, especially with this pandemic. Uh, not only has it been tough on the city, but no community has been hit harder than us seniors. So today we look even further, not only to our seniors, but those who have served this country and are now looking to us for support and services. This is why I drafted 1616, and this is a step ensuring we have a clear understanding of the number of senior veterans who are utilizing the available benefits and programs the city has to offer, as well as reviewing, like Peter and everyone else has said, our outreach efforts so that no veteran is left behind. The timing couldn't be more critical. So I want to thank Speaker Johnson, Chairs Chin and Deutsch for allowing the bill to be heard and allowing me to, to jump in at this moment. So God bless every one of you and thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Ballone. I am now going to turn it over to our last panelist on the first panel, uh, Coco Calhoun. Thank you. Um, thank you to Chair Deutsch and Chair Chin for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I've submitted about 10 pages of uh, testimony that has all kinds of facts and recommendations in terms of um, what I think we need to be doing. But I just wanted to highlight a few things, which basically that we're not doing anything um, sort of as a city, citywide, there are no uh, programs that work on outreach for veteran, you know, senior veterans and specifically those entitlements that they've earned. Um, I think Chair Chen pointed that out in her opening statement, and it's true. Um, if you go on DIFTA's website, the word veteran isn't even there. Um, and given that that's, you know, a sizable portion of New York City seniors, it should be. Um, you know, you think even a link over to DVS. Um, so I just also wanted to touch on, um, obviously, something everyone's talked about. Um, Pete was just referring to the digital divide that so many seniors are not online. Um, so we're all kind of talking about moving our services online, but that's not effective in the end um, because so many seniors can't access us uh, that way. Um, and I wanted to uh, just provide an anecdote. Um, a couple of weeks ago, one of my uh, attorneys and I went to a 90 year old Korean War veteran's house. Um, he was facing uh, he's been facing for many years eviction because of a nuisance situation. So we went to help him to clean it out. And we discovered, um, you know, we had done the vet check, mission vet check over the summer. We had given him a phone call. He said he was fine. 
that wasn't true. Um, you know, he was living with total just garbage everywhere. He was, it looks like surviving off of crackers that he had probably taken uh, from delis, diners, who knows. Um, you know, he has a phone. It's not a smartphone. He can't access anything. He used to rely on a senior program at the Y near his house. He can no longer go there. It's been closed for over a year, along with all the other senior centers. Um, and so, you know, this is a perfect example of someone who is the hardest hit, who is completely isolated. He has no family. Um, and we went to get him set up, you know, he had had food stamps, they got cut off. We went to apply, everything's online. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out, well, I guess I'll put my email in for it. Um, we did reach out, thankfully, um, for emergency grocery delivery, which is fantastic uh, for him. But this is just the perfect example, right, where no matter what services we're all providing, if we're not finding a way to reach those individuals, they are suffering. And, um, you know, so many of our clients tell us the library is how they got online and they can't do that anymore. Um, and there's no one there, even if they do have access, there's no one to help them figure it out. Whereas at the library there was, or at the senior centers. So I think we really need to come together as a community and figure out how do we reach these people? It can't, you know, it can't just be that check alone. It can't just be DVS alone. It really, it has to be a community effort. Um, and that's something that we're working on and putting together a plan with collaboration with a few other agencies to try to come up with something because it's something that we all need to work together on. It's not something one entity can attack. Um, and I just wanted to point out two things, uh, the veterans pension and aid in attendance, which is a benefit uh, from the VA that is life changing for a lot of seniors. And then also that the American Rescue Plan um, just reinstated a very, very important benefit, um, VRAP. Uh, it's Veterans Rapid Retraining Program. And it's essentially like anyone who doesn't qualify for the GI Bill, um, age 22 to 67, can qualify. Um, they haven't issued the regulations in terms of how this is going to be uh, distributed or you know how people can apply and all of that, but it's coming and um, it provides us the same stipend as the GI Bill. And so, and the main qualification aside from that is that you're unemployed due to COVID. So um, this is something that can help so many New Yorkers um, up to age 67. Um, but most important also is just getting people into the VA and the resources. And I think Joe mentioned that um, there's a RAND study that shows that the health outcomes from the VA once you get someone in there are better in almost every category than most of the major HMOs. Um, and um, yeah, I will leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Coco. I'm now gonna turn it over to Chair Deutsch, um, who will be asking questions first. Uh, panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Deutsch, please begin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge uh, some of my colleagues who have joined uh, Councilmember Brooks Powers, Councilmember Traeger, and uh, you heard from Councilmember Ballone before. Uh, thank you. Um, so I don't have I don't have uh, any questions for our panelists, but what I just want to say is that how important it is, like Councilmember Ballone mentioned, how important it is that when um, members, not only the City Council, members of the public, sees the you know how. CBOs, how um, not-for-profits, how organizations are working together, serving our veteran population. The resources are there and the people are there, the advocates are there. And um, you put in, you know, you put in so much um, with all your heart, you put in, you know, for our veteran population, not just for our seniors, for, for all the 220,000 veterans here in New York City. And it's so good to see that no matter where you turn, um, you could get help. A veteran can get help but the obstacle is knowing where to turn. And that's what this is all about, is giving out that information, letting people know um, that there are people out there who are not only willing to help, who actually get the help to those and fight for those veterans who are, are going through challenges and obstacles uh, you know, in their life. So I just wanna really thank um, you know, everyone, not only, not only those who testified, uh, Ashton's, Joe, Peter, um, Coco, 
And I want to thank all the advocates, um, all the volunteers, all the people who, who are um, who are working for the better of our veteran community for all that you do. Uh, this is probably one of the most important things that that we um, that we can do in life to serve our veterans for those who put their lives in the line uh, for, for our country. So I just want to thank you all, and it was so important to have um, to have you testify because you know when we have the administration come up and testify first. And then we hear from um, from the advocates. It, it's not always helpful, so we want the administration to hear firsthand um, what the challenges are for the the older adults in the veteran population. So I want to thank you all. Great. And now I'm going to turn it over to Council Member um, Margaret Chin. If you have any questions for the panelists, Chair Chin. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I. Yeah, I just really wanted to um, thank this panel um, for your testimony and for your service and, and all the great work that you do for our seniors and our uh, older veterans. It's, it's really heartwarming to hear that there are organizations and people out there who are doing this work uh, to support um, the aging veterans. And that's what we need to do in the council is to make sure that resources are available uh, to organization like yours so that you can continue to do the work, the great work that you do, and to make sure that agencies all working together. Uh, and it's just so important to get the information out. It's, it's oftentimes, it's very sad to hear, you know, when someone come to our office, you know, asking for help and it was like, and it's also last minute. You know, like they didn't know that these services were available. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank all of you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chet Chen. I, I just have a question, actually. It's not one of the panelists, but I have a question from, for, for Margaret from the Intrepid. Is that a live shot? It looks so tempting. I want to go. I want to run over there as soon as the hearing's over. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. Seeing as there are no hands raised, we are now gonna move into our second panel. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Mari Espinal, Luella Byers. Additionally, Vincent Garcia, Director of Intergovernmental uh, Affairs and Abuzam for DDS will be available to answer questions. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Amari Espinal, Vincent Garcia, and Luella Byers, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Mr. Espinal. I do. I do. Mr. Garcia? I do. Mrs. Byers? I do. Thank you. Mr. Espinal, you may begin when ready. Thank you and good morning to Chair Deutsch, Chair Chin, committee members and advocates. As we continue to fight this pandemic, I echo our commissioner's sentiments, the mayor and leaders like yourselves to stay safe, wear a mask and get vaccinated if you are eligible and have not yet done so. I am Amari Espinal, and I'm proud to serve as a community services team lead for the New York City Department of Veteran Services. I am joined today by Vincent Garcia, our Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Ombudsman, and Luella Byers, Assistant Commissioner, Bureau of Community Services at the Department for the Aging. I welcome this opportunity to testify about the senior veteran constituency, 
the programs and services we offer and our ongoing data collection efforts. Further, I welcome the opportunity to discuss the proposed legislation, Introduction 1616. New York City is home to approximately 200,000 veterans, active duty service members, and reservists. Our nation begins to shift, as our nation begins to shift from the most prolonged conflict in its history and individuals pursue other forms of service, the need to identify, engage, and assist our population becomes even more paramount. With this in mind, our agency began a robust data collection effort in the summer of 2019. Since then, our agency has entered into or is currently negotiating over 15 memoranda of understandings, comprising of approximately 70,000 veteran constituent contacts. In working with the VA alone, DVS has received access to the names, addresses, and corresponding VA benefits codes of roughly 30,000 individuals, with a large number being seniors. Through these efforts, DVS has strengthened and empowered our existing relationships with government agencies while developing new ones. In March 2020, DVS shifted its newsletter to occur weekly, serving as a source of information for veterans, advocates, and government officials. In moving into a weekly report, DVS increased the average email open rate by over 50%, directly connecting with constituents and providing a highlight of programs and services. Our other digital outreach tools bared similar beneficial outcomes. During 2020, our agency was able to double its number of Facebook posts, reaching a total of 225,579 individuals, a 63% increase compared to 2019. Similarly, the DBS Twitter account and Instagram page saw increased followers and interactions, leading to expanding the DBS brand and its familiarity with constituents. However, our engagement with the senior population exceeds digital outreach. To better connect and understand the veteran population's immediate needs, DVS has developed innovative ways to work smarter and better. While DVS has always maintained close ties with DIFTA, our commissioners have developed an ongoing relationship with one another. Whether in person or in a virtual setting, DIFTA continues to connect with providers who serve the general senior population. Throughout several events, DVS attended these meetings with DIFTA, providing an overview of our agency, the number of programs and services we offer, and the agency's contact information and social media handles. This way, a veteran or an individual on their behalf has the appropriate contact information to reach our agency and receive excellent service. As first suggested by the council, DBS also began reaching out to each of the respective community boards. Since starting this initiative in January, our agency is now hosting a community board event aggregated by borough and meeting each Thursday throughout the month of April. Lastly, as highlighted in our previous testimonies during the start of the pandemic, DVS worked tirelessly to distribute approximately 38,000 face masks to veteran constituents and provide 22 microgrants to VSOs throughout the New York City region. We are confident that our data collection efforts will continue to capture more veterans through these increasing touch points with the community and therefore expand services. During our last hearing, we spoke about the VetConnect NYC transition into an in-house platform. In transitioning into this platform, we carefully weighed the concerns and issues raised by nonprofit partners, the council, and constituents, while maintaining the quality of services veterans became familiar with. One central theme that arose from the council was DVS's accessibility to data. Since the transition into the Unitas platform, DVS can better maintain constituent data, highlight applicable services, and most importantly, gather the insight necessary as we move into our new chapter as an agency. For example, since our transition on October 1st, approximately 20% of all service requests are made by individuals who are 60 and older, totaling 178 service requests. According to our data, the top three service requests for aging veterans are benefits navigation, housing and shelter, and legal. Interestingly, since the transition onto the United's platform, service providers on the network can identify any specialized support or services for niche populations such as, quote, veterans, unquote, and, quote, seniors, unquote. Of the 114 organizations, 31 have listed seniors as a specialized population. When combined with the 14 mental health partners, we are confident that senior veterans, like their younger counterparts, have access to a wide range of services dedicated to meeting their needs. Through the most troubling times of the pandemic, New Yorkers everywhere, and particularly seniors, faced increasing levels of isolation and a lack of connection and interaction. We are proud to share that our Mission VetCheck Outreach Initiative is still ongoing. 
Although the height of the pandemic is thankfully behind us, its impacts will be felt for months and years to come. That's why we firmly believe in continuing the effort to make direct contact with our constituents. It's imperative that they know they are not alone and that there are resources available to help, especially for our older veterans. To date, Mission VetCheck has made 28,670 calls to veterans and their families with a 23% engagement rate. The initiative has also connected 869 veterans to information resources and services. Mission VetCheck has also recently served as a conduit for vaccine information as our volunteers are equipped with helpful information from both the city and the VA. Through the generous services of the New York National Guard, more than 12,000 calls were placed during the darkest months of April, May, and June 2020. Starting in July 2020, New York CARES volunteers began supporting the project, and to date, more than 400 of their volunteers have supported Mission VetCheck. The New York CARES volunteers who support this initiative have been truly incredible. Some have been making calls to our community every week since our partnership launched in July, because they realize how much of a difference a simple supportive phone call can make in someone's life. Over the course of two focus group sessions we recently held, one volunteer expressed how grateful the veteran was to hear from someone looking to help. Quote, I was praying that someone would reach out to me and your call came just when I needed it. End quote. Expressed Kai who has volunteered for the project for the last few months. This veteran articulates the feelings shared by so many others since the onset of the pandemic. As Mission Vet Check continues to make calls, reaching an ever increasing number of veterans, we are confident that our reach will continue to expand and more veterans will receive the services they've come to rely upon. One of the most significant concerns facing New Yorkers during the pandemic is food insecurity. To address this need, DVS has partnered with Get Food NYC to ensure that our veteran population can access all of the avenues through which the city provides food assistance to New Yorkers. To support these efforts, DVS coordinators receive training and certification as Get Food Authorized Enrollers and are assisting veterans in navigating this program's requirements to get food. Veterans can independently or through one of our DVS coordinators submit a food request once every three days or two weeks of recurring orders. Since the start of this program, DVS has assisted 552 individual veterans with gaining access to food. Of these 552 requests, approximately 45% are seniors. As the council is aware, our work to address food insecurity goes well beyond Get Food NYC. Since the pandemic, DVS has collaborated with HelloFresh in partnership with the state's Nourish New York initiative. Through this collaboration, DVS works with various organizations to distribute 350 to 400 HelloFresh food kits to veteran households per week. Since this program's launch, DVS has delivered 65,000 533 meal kits to veteran households, 24,000 in this year alone. Further, in addition to the HelloFresh initiative, DVS has also actively engaged with the Bronx Food Initiative to deliver meals to hungry constituents. Through this collaboration, DVS has distributed 25,632 meals, uh, boxes to hungry New York City veterans, and over 9,270 meal boxes this year alone. As we continue developing internal programs and initiatives, DVS looks forward to collaborating with outside organizations to combat food insecurity facing our constituency. Veterans experiencing homelessness is one of the foundational pillars of this agency. Even during the pandemic, which DVS understands has created greater housing and security, DVS continues to house veterans to sure, ensure that they are in safe, secure housing. While our veteran peer coordinators are no longer working in city shelters, they continue their important work to house veterans, albeit under different circumstances. For example, house viewings and interviews shifted to virtual modes and management companies opted to complete a phone or video call interviews with potential veteran applicants. If virtual options were not sufficient, our VPCs would safely conduct physical inspections of the units, pick up and drop off documentation and assist with the veterans move. Through these efforts, DVS has found notable success. Since the start of the fiscal year, we've housed 105 veterans, 33 of whom are seniors. Interestingly, when taking into account those who are 55 and older, that number increases to 56. This past November alone, DVS staff housed 29 individuals, our second highest monthly total in the past three years. To achieve this goal, we've utilized existing programs such as city FEPS, 
HUD VASH and VASH Continuum, providing our constituency with various housing options. Further, we've engaged and communicated with landlords to expand the pool of housing options for our veterans. When considering the specific needs of our older population, DVS developed innovative methods to house these veterans. Due to delays in obtaining documents at the onset of the pandemic, DVS worked directly with supporting veterans in obtaining documents. We expanded our accessibility by accepting applications via email, the online portal, and scheduling phone calls to assist in their submission. And we worked hand in hand with other city agencies to coordinate remote briefing calls to inform better empower and assist our constituency in finalizing their applications. When considering the three main housing programs in City FEPS, HUD VASH and VASH Continuum, senior veterans accounted for 50, 33 and 14% respectively. These metrics show that DVS not only connects and communicates with our aging veteran population, but we ensure that they are included and represent sizable samples of our programs. For example, take the story of veteran M. He is a 70-year-old U.S. Navy veteran referred to DVS by a partner agency for assistance locating housing for himself, his partner, and his adult son. He began working with the DVS VPC in June 2020. Due to his medical conditions, veteran M was seeking housing that could accommodate both him and his partner's limited mobility in and in an area that would keep them close to support systems. After seeking and viewing several units that did not meet accessibility needs, in January 2021, the veteran was able to move out with his family to a unit in Staten Island. Since his move out, the VPC has been in touch. They were able to secure furniture for their two bedroom apartment and are settling into their new home. Or take the story of veteran F. He is a 65 year old army veteran referred to DVS's HSS team in August, 2020 for housing assistance. Veteran F was chronically homeless at the time of referral. After receiving the referral, Veteran F was scheduled by DBS to interview for a supportive housing unit in the Bronx to help his transition from homelessness to housing. Veteran F began the process with a virtual interview and eventually moved out in November to his own newly furnished studio apartment. As we continue to work smarter, utilizing the number of resources available to New York City veterans, such as City FEPS, HUD VASH, and VASH Continuum, we can assure you that senior veterans will continue to receive the care, assistance, and engagement they've come to rely on. It was only five short years ago that our agency evolved from a mayoral office to a New York City charter agency. During the first years of this agency, our staff was comprised of four dedicated employees with the vision to expand, collect, and engage the then 210,000 veterans who call New York City home. Since then, our agency has grown to approximately 40 employees, almost 70,000 veteran contacts, and a newsletter and social media outreach that exponentially expands from year to year. While we believe that there is room for improvement to assist our constituency, it is crucial to recognize how far we've come, particularly how this small but mighty group of civil servants stands dedicated to helping each New York City veteran and their family every day. As we consider the proposed legislation, we recognize the need to better track data across our veteran population and expand our accessibility to that data. As discussed earlier in the testimony, our agency is doing just that. Since the summer of 2019, through our MOU initiatives and inspired by Local Law 23, DVS has engaged our sister agencies to receive contact information for veterans currently receiving particular city services. In addition, DVS has acted on the goals expressed in Intro 1616 through Executive Order 65. Through EO 65, DVS has launched a community survey to compile the demographics of our community and their specific needs. DVS is still evaluating privacy considerations and operational implications related to the bill, but we stand committed to the intent of this legislation and reassure the council we are actively collecting relevant data of veterans across New York City in creative ways and continue to grow our veteran contact list. We look forward to continued conversations with you on this important issue. As we navigate the challenges presented by the pandemic and beyond, DVS will continue to find new ways to best collaborate with DIFTA and all of our fellow agencies to develop and provide quality services and inform the, to the New York City veteran community and information to the New York City veteran community. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on this matter and look forward to any questions you or committee members may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinal. I will now turn it over to Ms. Ms. Byers, you may begin. 
Sifter is here for Q&A. Oh, you're not giving testimony this afternoon? No. Oh, okay. All right. So I will now turn it over to um, Chair Deutsch if he has any um, questions for this the administration. Have, uh, Chair Deutsch. Are we having uh, testimony from the um, Department of Aging? Well, Ms. Byers is the only um, admin here from, from DIFTA and she said she's available for questions. Oh, okay. But no testimony. Okay. All right, um, so my first question is, this is to DVS. Uh, how many veterans above the age of 60 uh, live in New York City? Uh, so currently uh, we do have a breakdown of that council member. Uh, and looking at the latest numbers, um, uh, we, we do see that uh, approximately 70% of the population uh, in New York City uh, are senior veterans. 70% of the population as a whole or 70% of the population of veterans? Uh, so, so right now, DBS is able to confirm that those who are 55 and older account for approximately 71% of the New York City veteran population. City veteran population. Um, how many... How many of these um, senior veterans are, are homeless? So uh, we we were attempting to get that information from HUD. Unfortunately, HUD does not provide um, ages uh, for uh, for their homeless population. Council member, um, they, don't, they don't provide. No, they don't have. They have. They have ages, right? They have to have ages. Uh, they they did not disclose that information, Council Member. When when uh, we did uh, the research, okay. we were not able to 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 look at that information from HUD in particular. Do you know why? Uh, I, I don't have an exact reason, Council Member, but uh, we are actively uh, pursuing that information in order uh, to utilize it uh, to our best advantage. Um. So how, how is, I don't understand, how is DVS pursuing that? If HUD has the ages of homeless individuals, now wouldn't it just be like an email requesting if they had the information, uh, if they knew how many veterans um, are, are listed, wouldn't that just be like an easy number with today's technology just to respond? Is it something that is DVS is not concerned about that they don't uh, like push uh, hard to give that information. I mean, you have DVS that's an agency here in New York City. Shouldn't it be the responsibility of DVS to receive that information? Uh, of course, council member, and it's certainly not that, that we're not, uh, we don't care about that population. Uh, I can have my colleague, Vincent Garcia, uh, expand on the communication with HUD, uh, if you would. Yeah, sure, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's definitely something that's ongoing. I think it's being able to recognize if there's any privacy concerns or or other metrics and being able to receive that data, council member. But what I can assure you is, is one of two things: one, that we are actively working on them and also collaborating with our sister agencies in the event they're able to provide any of that information themselves. But I think second to that, as you know, we spoke about on those MOU initiatives, it's figuring out alternative ways to better track that information on our housing populations and see how best we can extrapolate that data moving forward. Um, how long is DVS in, in uh, an agency here in New York City? Uh, roughly, I believe our birthday was April 5th, uh, sir. So roughly about a little more than five years. I'm sorry? A little more than five years now. A little more than five years. Days, so in yeah. five years, um, DVS couldn't get um, general counsel to let HUD know if they can give that information to DVS? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's more so just being able to increases. As you know, when we start with just four employees and we've increased the numbers throughout, it's also being able to increase those touch points and those communications with not just our city partners, but federal partners. So what I can say is that that's something of, of paramount importance to us and we're really working forward to develop a more working relationship with us to be able to get that information for you. So isn't it, is, isn't it like if we even have the city part of it, at least we have some kind of numbers I'm sorry. Can you just... you, yeah, I just want, I just want to tell um, um, people testifying to DBS, if you don't have an answer to something, just tell me I don't have an answer or you're right. But don't don't give me excuses and tell me waiting for general counsel 
when it's, it's over five years, when something could have been done. So let's get to the facts. If you have an answer, I'd like to hear the answer. If I'm right, just tell me, yes, you're right. We need to do better. But don't give me an answer that we waiting for general counsel we have to ask because that is not an answer to me. Yeah, that's perfectly understood, sir. Okay. Um, how many senior veterans does DBS serve specifically? Uh, so, of course, are, are you saying, council member, uh, in, in general or uh, when it comes to housing? In general. Okay. Uh, so, currently we are at a number of, uh, one second. Uh, uh, we had uh, 178 uh, service episodes uh, for clients age 60 and over. 178 <laughs> as in 178? 178 service episodes within the, uh, the Vet Connect NYC uh, platform that we uh, disaggregated for, for age over 60 and over. So out of 70% of a senior, um, um, a veteran senior population out of 200,000 veterans, so you're telling me 178 veterans um, over, over 60, 55 that DBS served? Well, that, that was, those numbers are from uh, October 1st through March 31st of 2021, council member. Um, so what, what is the previous year for the full year? Uh, give me one moment. So we have uh, 148 uh, for fiscal year 2021. 148 total. For, for the fiscal year, correct. So, okay. Uh, th this is why we have this joint hearing today between DBS and DIFTA, uh, because DIFTA has information and they have resources that could help seniors, uh, senior veterans. And the numbers you've given me, do you think those, are, those numbers are good? Like oh, Council Member, we're, we're, we're always seeking to expand our, our messaging and outreach. Yeah, um, but 100, 100, between 140 and 170, 140 for a total year, um, that's, that's totally like unacceptable because how can you, you know, you know if you had 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000, because 70% are seniors, right? So you're reading me from what, from Bet Connect? Uh, that, that is correct, Council Member. So um, that's still a very I'm getting, I'm getting, And I'm getting an update, uh, Councilman. I have a, it's 1,620 since the start of that connect in uh, fiscal year 2019. Which is, which is also a very low number. Um, now, we keep on saying, and DBS, you in your testimony, that we have 200,000 veterans right, 200,000 plus veterans, the numbers keep on changing from 210 to 20, 200. Um, how, many, how many New York City veterans are there? Uh, so currently council member, there are uh, 149,000 uh, veterans. And- uh, Your testimony, excuse me, one, say 200. Excuse me, excuse me it's 151,000 uh, veterans in New York City. Uh, in addition to that, there are approximately 49,000 uh, active duty, uh, reserve, and National Guard members that are currently serving. Uh, okay, so um, okay, so we're talking about a population of about 200,000, correct? That is correct, Councilman. And um, does DVS represent 200,000 veterans, New York City veterans? We, we strive to assist any veterans that, that come to our agency for assistance council member. And uh, we, we, you know, we work with our sister city agencies as well as our state and federal counterparts to, to address those needs as best we can. So in every testimony, I'm, I'm hearing about uh, the 200,000 veterans that DVS serves here in New York City. And you, you mentioned in your numbers of engagement and the rates of engagement to veterans um, 
What are those numbers again? If you could repeat those numbers of engagement that you read in your testimony. And um, if you could just repeat that, that paragraph. Uh, the one that I read in the testimony, Councilman? Yeah, right. Yes, uh, if you'd allow me one moment, please. Um, uh, v Vincent, do you have that, uh, those numbers uh, ready available? Sure, uh, what, what numbers in particular are you looking for, Chair? I'm sorry? Uh, I'm just curious, what numbers in particular are you looking for? Are well, you spoke about the numbers of engagement, the engagement rates. Oh, well, I, I believe the number that, that you're referring to then is that based on the number of service episodes that we have within Vet Connect, 20% of those are individuals that we can, uh, in our platform, signify that they are 16 and older. So of the Vet Connect population that we have, 20% are 16 and older of those engagements. Is that what you're referring to, Council Member? No, I'm, I'm referring to the, the engagement um, um, engagement rates that you mentioned before in your testimony. If you just look at your testimony, um, you mentioned... <laughs> Yeah, when you mentioned two, that, I'm when sorry, you mentioned you do outreach to veterans and their families. Um, the the metrics that I, I believe may go through is that we currently is we're, we're either negotiating or have roughly about 70,000 contact information for the veteran constituency. Then we have 20% of the service episodes are of senior veterans. And then with the mission vet check, we have a 23% engagement rate. repeat that again? Yes, sir. Uh, so based on our, our MOU initiative and then the list that we received from the VA, there's approximately 70,000 contacts that, we're, that we either receive or are working on. Uh, then there's 20% of our service episodes within Vet Connect since October 1st, since transition. That is uh, uh, the senior population, ages 60 and older. And then in our Mission Vet Check initiative, um, there is a 23% engagement rate from the calls that we've made. And those calls are 28,670. So that 28,670, uh, there's a 23% engagement rate from there. And that has led to 869 service episodes. Which is still extremely low. Um, with respect to the community survey uh, issued by DVS, um, have the preliminary numbers revealed any information about senior veterans needs during the pandemic? So uh, thank you for that question, Council Member. We are still collecting data as the survey was recently launched. Uh, we do uh, collect data on the service era in which the veteran serves. And uh, there is an opportunity to collect age uh, afterwards, but uh, we're still waiting on collecting that information uh, you know, to a, a uh, acceptable sample size. Uh, the, the uh, survey is currently set to uh, be available until October 1st of this year. Um, how does how does DVS, um, considering this this important hearing, how DVS and Department of Aging are working together, how does DVS and DIFTA uh, do work together to serve the senior population? You did mention that you have a very close relationship, and that's not what I heard at the last hearing when I questioned them about the, the Department of Aging. Um, what their, how many conversations they have and what kind of um, partnership they have working together about senior population. So I'm, I'm asking you, what is DBS and DIFTA? How, are they, how do they work together? I appreciate that question, council member. So uh, we at DBS strive to maintain open working relationships with, with all of our uh, city counterparts. Uh, we, we do work with DIFTA if uh, they have a, an issue that uh, if we have a veteran with an issue that we cannot address directly, uh, we do make referrals uh, to DIFTA. They are in our uh, Vet Connect platform currently, um, and we do make referrals for them for, for different um, needs, such as transportation, uh, employment, or vocational training for seniors, uh, things of that nature. And how does it work if the Department of Aging uh, receives a, um, an inquiry about a uh, veteran? So we, uh, we communicate with them what the need is that the veteran has. And so, uh, so they send you those referrals? You're sending referrals back and forth? How does it work? 
Uh, we do get referrals. We, we do work uh, on, a, on a case by case basis uh, when uh, we do need the assistance of, of each other. Yes. How do they reach out? Um, how do they reach out to you to, uh, to DBS when they need assistance? Do they go on the portal? They contact so the so uh, we can we can uh, make a referral within the Vet Connect platform uh, as a courtesy. You know, typically there is a phone call or email that follows that. Do you know what the number is like for for the year 20, 2020 of how many referrals uh, DBS uh, sent over to? Uh, how, how many referrals DIFTA sent over to DVS? Uh, I do not have that data right now, uh, council member. We are willing to share that uh, once we can collect that and get back to you. Uh, is there a, uh, uh, a liaison to DIFTA? Um, is there a veteran uh, liaison to the Department of Aging? So yes, uh, again, our commissioners have been in constant communication um, you know, and I'll let our IGA uh, speak on that if he has anything to add to that. Yeah, uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, remember, there's a veteran liaison in the local law 42, uh, but the other thing is that there's a number of touch points between ourselves and the counterparts. So for myself being the IGA director, I'm in constant communication with my IGA counterpart at DIFTA. And then sometimes that's how we share information. That's how sometimes referrals make it. Um, you don't have an estimate of how many referrals you may think you had in 2020? Uh, unfortunately, at this time, no, sir, but we're more than happy to circle back and, and get back to you with that number. We want to make sure that we give you the most appropriate number. Um, do you feel that there is, um, that we need to do better between the collaboration between DIFTA and, and DBS? I think there's always room to improve. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, what, what we're able to do is, you know, we expand the nation, we, we get better and we increase these touch points. There's always different things that we can always improve. And I mean, hearing the advocates speak, you know, they spoke about a lot of great things the agency does, but also a lot of room for improvement. So I would say, yes, um, there's always room for improvement. And that's what we strive to do. You mentioned, can you just talk about a few, a few ways that you feel that we can improve the relationship and the information? Um, that we share between Department of Aging and DVS? Um, yeah, absolutely. I will, uh, I'm, I'm happy to start that off and then I can um, you know, transition over to my counterpart at DIFTA to see if there's anything else that she would like to add. But I, I think really just um, you know, collaboration on certain information, it's collaboration as, as we were doing for this year and I think beforehand on the number of programs that may be accessible for senior veterans, for example. And it's really just having that outreach to get out there. You know, there's a lot of wonderful things that I think DIPT is doing, DVS is doing, the city's doing as a whole. It's how can we make sure that this information um, is there for our veteran constituency so they're well aware of it and they know where to go and how to find it. And then I, I'll pass it off over to my counterpart. I would say uh, DIPT works very closely with all our colleagues at sister agencies. We do similar um, outreach to um, Department of Veteran Services by staying up to date on any concerns that our veterans have. I think over the past year, especially during this pandemic, I think our relationship has strengthened. Our commissioner has monthly meetings with our providers. These are borough-wide meetings and we have had the commissioner of DVS attend these meetings where he can interact directly with our providers and let them know which resources and benefits are available uh, to their veterans population. So we thought that was a great link of having our providers who are on the ground, who provide the direct services, being in touch with the DVS and the DVS commissioner and also contact information on how to reach out to DVS. We also reach out to DVS through our InterGov office. So if there's anything that we need, we will let our InterGov person know and they will reach out. Thank you. I, mean, I, I would just think that if we, if there was a close partnership, there would be testimony from, from the Department of Aging, right? Because you would have probably like uh, 10 pages like Coco who testified before on how both agencies do work together. Um, so this is just, you know, I, I, I you know, the Department of Aging has a great chair who's very vocal and holds the, the, the agency accountable. But when you come in a hearing, when you come to a, a DVS hearing and you don't have testimony of how you work closely together, how you give that information over, then that doesn't show 
that you do work together. This is just like, to me, it's lip service. Um, we all know, uh, first I wanna ask, how many homebound uh, veterans are there in New York City? So, uh, Council Member, we are, we are tracking the uh, number of veterans in, in the city as a whole. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the number of homebound uh, veterans currently. Uh, we are working uh, to track down that information as well. But you did mention in the beginning of the testimony that um, people should stay safe, they should wear masks, they should get vaccinated. You know, we do have um, vaccinations for homebound seniors. And how are you, how are you talking about people should get vaccinated? and especially our, our senior population who's been hit very hard. And then when I ask you a question about how many homebound seniors, when we do have the services here in New York City to vaccinate homebound seniors, and you don't have that number. So how are homebound veteran seniors supposed to remain safe if DBS doesn't have that number and we can't get them vaccinated and we're well, we're well a year over the when since the pandemic started. I appreciate that that question, Council Member. And it's something that we've uh, been collaborating with 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 the New York Harbor VA. Um, as you all know, we, we held a town hall uh, on the vaccine uh, process. Uh, we inform uh, you know anyone that comes our way on uh, all avenues of receiving a vaccination. And, and, you know, we do understand that, uh, that in the veteran, within the veteran community, uh, mm -hmm. word, uh, uh, information does travel by word of mouth. So uh, we, we, are, we are trying to, to do both virtual and in-person outreach uh, as best as we can. Uh, and, you know, word of mouth is very good, but the whole purpose of DBS is to disseminate the information, to get the information out. And we did speak about at the beginning of the hearing how, you know, with the work of all the advocates, uh, it's so important because it's all about getting the word out, not waiting for phone calls. And what you just mentioned is we're waiting for we're waiting for calls, you know, for people to inquire about the vaccination. But it's DVS's job to reach out and get a hold of those homebound seniors to make sure they get vaccinated. So that that answer is totally unacceptable to me because you need to get out there. And most of the senior population, not everyone has um, technology. They don't have, you don't have computers. And so you don't have a plan. There's, there's like no plan. And we're already in, in the end of April and you really have no way to, no, you have no way of knowing, um, you know, if we could uh, vaccinate the senior veteran population because you don't have that information. So what are your plans moving forward now that you don't have that information in order to get uh, um, to, to do more outreach and to make sure they all get vaccinated? So I, I will say, Council Member, that, uh, you know, I, I will say again that we have been doing outreach in person with uh, various American Legion and VFW posts, uh, which tend to have a majority of senior members, uh, as well as different uh, community board uh, veteran committees. Uh, in person as well to to get the word out uh, to, to the 70, local. You mentioned seventy percent of the veteran population are seniors. So, and you just mentioned uh, three or four uh, organizations and not for profits. How you get the information out? So, that's still seventy percent of the veteran population are uh, seniors, right? That's so correct. Is that enough? The work you're doing is that enough, or do you um, have other plans now that it's a concern um, to reach out to the homebound and the senior population to make sure they get vaccinated? So uh, we're always looking to expand and amplify uh, amplify our, our messaging and uh, and our reach. Out. Is always, yes, is always looking to expand, but at the end of the day, what what are you going to do to expand it? Well, we would. Uh, like you, need to, you need to have a plan, right? Um, you know, it's not just about talking about how we need to do better, how we need to expand, how we need to do more outreach, but how is DBS going to do that moving forward? So, uh, like, do you have a plan? Have, do you have a uh, a plan of 
what are your plans? Like, we'd like to know. So, so we would we would plan to to uh, ask DIFTA for your assistance with okay. uh, outreach okay. to to the senior population. Uh, we, we we are aware that some uh, senior uh, pop, uh, senior benefits do overlap with veteran benefits. Uh, so we would love to collaborate and coordinate with with them and, and any other uh, community partners, uh, you know, and able to in order to get us to that point. Okay, that's that's very good. That's a plan, um, and that's why we're here today. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, all right, I'm I'm gonna give over. Um, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give it over to my colleague um, Chia Chen to ask some questions. Thank you, Chair Deutsch. Um, thank you for your question. It just really shows that we have a lot of work to do, that the agencies are not working as, working as closely as we really want it. Um, I have a couple of questions for DVS. Do you contract uh, with service provider nonprofits uh, to, provide, um, to provide assistance uh, to veterans? And, also, uh, so, and especially and especially to senior veterans. So so thank you for that question, Council Member. So we do have uh, we do have partners within the Vet Connect platform that do provide uh, services specifically to seniors. Um, and as far as contracts go, I, I would uh, allow my colleague Vincent Garcia to expand on that if he would. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think um, to answer your question, um, uh, Chairwoman, is that. Um, the, the, excuse me, the contracts that we have right now, some of them are still ongoing, but the ones that have been executed are really through uh, Vet Connect and United's platform, which really works with nonprofit providers. If the question is contracts in like a monetary sense or the for-profit business or something like that, that deals with these communities, um, that's not necessarily something that uh, DBS as an agency because of our size um, has, but I can also open up the floor to DIFTA if they would like to discuss any of the contracts they may have to focus on those senior populations and what those look like. Before DIFTA, uh, so you use the Vet Connect. So there are, how many, organi how many nonprofit organization um, do you contract with? That yes, works with the, um, uh, the Vet Connect? Of course, yeah. So there are roughly a total of 114 service providers on the Vet Connect platform. I think one thing that's important is that all the, uh, platform providers that jump onto the VetConnect platform are not there for monetary gain. They're really there to be able to connect with the constituency and provide those services that they have. So of those 114, I believe our last count was 31 uh, focused specifically on the senior population or that is a population that they specialize in. So do you fund those, org the, those organizations? We do not, ma'am. Those organizations have different uh, streaming processes for funds to which they go through. We actually just serve as a conduit to essentially connect the individual with the provider and then handle a lot of the background information that can, as well as amplifying those messages and that information to ensure that our constituency is aware of vetted service providers um, that assist in the nonprofit world for whatever um, services that they're looking for at that time. Hmm, interesting. That's, that's like a total different total different model um, from, you know, DIFTA has, you know, senior centers and case management. And, and so the group that testified earlier, uh, like uh, the SAGE group and VOLT, you do not provide any funding or any, uh, con do you have any contract with them for the services uh, that they do? That is correct. So those, those organizations that testified previously our organizations are on the VetConnect platform. So for example, there's something that a veteran is seeking that they offer, you know, we, we connect the two together. Um, but there are some additional contracts that we have uh, that may connect to some of those providers on there, but those have not been launched um, as of yet. So when you talked about, you mentioned a couple of the organizations that you work with to do outreach, like um, all the American Legion uh, chapters, and how many, in total, how many of those uh, veteran organizations do you reach out to? Well, I can say that uh, I can get you the exact number and I'm happy to follow up on that, but I can say that we reached out to every single organization because we reached out to them also to include them within the uh, VSO micro grant program that we talked about in the testimony, as well as face message uh, distribution. So we reached out to every single partner in the five boroughs and then we maintain those open communications to let them know about the VSO micro grant program 
but also include them in our newsletter and just general outreach. So if they know a veteran that's in their bucket, send them over to us, or if there's anything that we can provide as them through the conduit, we're more happy to do so. So do you also coordinate with the um, Department of Homeless Services? Do they work with you to let you know how many uh, veterans are in their homeless facility and of how many of those are seniors? Do um, you get it, those statistics from them? Uh, I, I believe that we most definitely can get the statistics from DHS, but I can say that we do work with them in regards to housing um, homeless veterans as a whole. Um, I know that there are some reports to go as well as some uh, internal dialogue whenever we're housing an individual and see what stock is available out there for vacant units and everything else like that. So there is a communication and a relationship there between the two agencies. But do, do they actively or do you actively get that information from them in terms of like the homeless, you know, homeless veterans um, that are in their shelter system and how many of them are seniors? Do you get that report for them from them? Um, we should. I can circle back to make sure, and specifically for the senior bucket in that population. I know there are reports uh, that are provided to us that we're able to check on a regular basis. I can circle back with you, ma'am, about the, the senior veter veteran population as a whole. What I would also like to add is that EO uh, Executive Order 65 that we spoke about within the testimony um, and its parameters may actually be able to alleviate a lot of those concerns because it will require that interagency uh, connection in providing that data directly to DPS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and, and, I mean, that's what's yeah, that's what's important. So that's how, because the interagency connection and working together is so important. Because if they let you know um, in terms of the the number of veterans that are, I mean, these are the veterans that you can help directly uh, to make sure working together with DHS get them housing or the support services that they need, or, or to make sure that DHS is taking care of these. Uh, homeless veteran, right? Uh, I think that's why the, the uh, interconnection working together is so important. And the same thing with DIFTA. Um, the I guess the question uh, to you, Assistant Commissioner, is that like DIFTA have all these providers right, for our senior centers, for our home deliver meal program, case management. Are we collecting data uh, in terms of are uh, the, the consumers are veteran? Are we collecting that data? So um, we are pleased to say that about 5% of our population are veterans. And those are the ones who identify as veterans because we do ask for information, but if they do not identify, then we wouldn't have that information. But for the ones who did, there's about 5% of our older adults who participated in, in DIFTA services. So how do this group of senior veterans, how do they find out about services that the Department of Veterans Service provide? I mean, in terms of the two agency working together, I mean, you got the number, uh, you know who the senior uh, veterans are. So how do you connect them to Department of Veterans Services so they know that they can access all these benefits that they're entitled to? As I mentioned earlier, or well, how is yeah? As I mentioned earlier, um, during this pandemic and especially since trying to build this on this relationship, we have had our providers meet with the commissioner of DVS to tell them about our services, to tell them where to get resources so that in their own neighborhood where there are veterans who have a need, our providers will know where to reach and how to reach out to access these services. Yeah, so we, I guess we as the uh, Chair Doi talk about, we would like to know in terms of how many referrals are provided. Like the question that Chair Deutsch asked about homeless, I mean, a homebound veteran. Uh, I think we should be able to get that number from the Home Deliver Meal Program, for example, right? That's the program that service uh, homebound seniors. And within that population, if we can identify um, the number of veterans, I mean, that information uh, can be given to uh, DVS uh, to do the, the vaccine or 
provide other services that they need. I mean, if, data if I, if has I valuable may... information, yeah. And if I may, Council Member, um, you know, I appreciate the question. Of course, we, we always try to gather information for as many veterans as we can. Uh, but, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up, bring up an issue is that um, there are many veterans out there that do not uh, identify as veterans or, or do not wish to identify as veterans um, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, they may not know that they qualify as a veteran. Um, some with uh, less than honorable discharges may not feel that they're entitled to veteran benefits. Those that were um, discharged for, for unfavorable uh, characterizations uh, may not feel that, that they're entitled to that. So uh, it is an issue um, that, 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 that we are aware of. And, and that's one of the main uh, focus of this community survey is to really try to inform the veteran community that there are services available to them, uh, regardless of length of service, uh, service era, discharge characterization, any, any demographic uh, that a veteran falls under in the city of New York, there, there are services available to them. So that is something that, that we are actively uh, working on um, getting, getting to the crux of. So does the providers, I mean, I just, did, did your provider know that, I mean, are there like information like that that's, that's given out so people know that it, like how would they qualify as a veteran or just as a veteran? Um, no matter what, that these services are available. Because Stifto also has a very uh, large caregiver program. So if the veteran might not want to identify themselves, but their family members or their, um, the people who you know, take care of them, uh, that information is also valuable in terms of getting the, the caregivers uh, to understand what services are available um, to veterans. Right, yeah. and if to, if to provide a wide range of services and it's all open to veterans and all older New Yorkers six years over. So our providers who are providing case management, as you say, caregiver, any of those services, they know where to access the service. So if someone comes in and they identify as being a veteran, they will get that service. And even if someone just comes in, I'm six years old or whatever services are available in DIFTA is available to that person. Yeah, I, I think also as a as additional point in there, um, to your point, um, uh, Chairwoman, is that with EO65, one of the things that's also added is that the number of city forms that are out there of intake forms for the varying agencies, there's going to be two questions that are added, essentially figuring out whether this individual served in the capacity of their service. So while those forms are still voluntary, it gives uh, questions to forms that may not be there to really capture that veteran population. So to your point, whether it's the, the individual veteran themselves who's comfortable filling out this form or it's a caregiver on their behalf, this is another means to which we can track this information and also track that caregiver status to be able to, to you know, provide these benefits and information to their constituency. But EO65 is another one of those means that we're able to identify this issue and hopefully through this matter can, can find a solution to it. How large is DVS? As in I mean, the, how, many, how many staff do you have? I believe the total staff number is 39 and we're authorized for 44. So if you look at that as a number for that compared to our constituency, it's roughly one to, I believe, um, somewhere around uh, 14,000 or so. So like one employee is handling about 14,000 individuals in our constituency. Okay, I know that uh, Chair Deutsch, right? The council fought for this agency. I remember the, the legislation that was introduced to establish the Department for Veteran Services. So I think that this additional resources need to be um, allocated. And if the, I mean, uh, DVS should also have resources to contract with uh, CBO service provider to assist you uh, to, to, to help our, our veterans and our senior veterans. Um, I mean, that's our hope when we fought for this agency. So I think that um, that is something that we, we have to uh, make sure that you have the resources uh, to do the work um, that you do. Uh, because this is a, an important population that has been ignored and we gotta make sure that uh, we have the resources to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're, we're definitely grateful for that as well as to uh, you know, Chairman Dewitcher's ongoing assistance and advocacy on that behalf. Um, and it's something that we're, we're most definitely looking into because it's something that um, you know, will potentially be in the future of DVS and something that we care about greatly. 
And what I could say is like, you know, both myself and Amari are veterans and, and are individuals that serve. So we're, we're well aware of understanding like, you know, there's many of us that are out there and we wanna make sure that we touch our, that constituency and those family members of ours. Yeah, and I guess my last question is that we talked about the, um, you know, the uh, uh, digital divide and, and uh, the lack of technology um, for the veterans and for the senior. So going forward, how, how can uh, DVS and DIFTA work together to make sure that senior, senior veterans uh, have access to computers and training so that they can take advantage of all the programs that are online um, that providers uh, like senior centers are providing or to be able to sign up for programs and benefits. So are you guys pushing for um, you know, tablets for um, seniors and, and Wi-Fi or broadband? Anybody I'm happy to, to, I'm happy to hear DIFTA's, uh, you know, uh, points on this, but, uh, you know, we do have uh, access for any veteran or their family member into the Vet Connect platform through telephone as well. Um, so they, they will receive the same services uh, as if they uh, applied online for an assistance request. But helping see, but helping like the, the veterans, especially the seniors, like to get the equipment. You know, to have, to be able to, to have a, a, a tablet, an iPad that they can go online and, and really participate in a lot of the services that DIFTA provide, um, right? The DIFTA Senior Center, they've been doing, providing a lot of great virtual program, exercise program, lectures. Or, so how are the two agencies coordinating to make sure that our senior veterans also can take advantage of this opportunity? Sure. Uh, I'd like to open the floor to, to DIFTA if they'd want to uh, elaborate on that. Thank you for that question. Um, so as you said that we have a lot of program online and we have been working on getting equipment. Equipment has been one of the largest challenges, whether it's, be, it's iPads or phone or stuff. Our providers have been really innovative in trying to make sure that there are programs that are available both through the iPad and both on the phone. And it's something that we have not given up. We're pursuing all avenues to be able to acquire um, iPads for, or other equipment for our seniors. Um, we, uh, we have a few things in the work that I can't really um, speak about right now. As soon as we do, we will let you know our plan, but I just want you to know that it's something that we discuss on a daily basis. It's something that we also reach out and trying to find the resources to be able to do this. Well, I mean, we just want to make sure that the, both agencies are, are working together on that to make sure that our, you know, older veterans uh, get the services that they need. Uh, and finally, I think that with, uh, besides the uh, iPads and, uh, and broadband, um, I just think that in this budget process that, um, that DVS should talk with Chair Deutsch to make sure that you have adequate funding and we're working together with uh, DIFTA on that. And recently the mayor announced announce the community care plan. I think within that plan, we have to make sure that our older veterans are included in that plan because we're talking about expanding um, more senior centers and, and more North program. And finally, uh, the question to DIFTA, <laughs> when is our senior center <laughs> going to be reopening <laughs> safely? <laughs> when, when? And a lot of seniors, and I'm sure veteran seniors, uh, are looking, you know, are asking us that question. So, and I'm sure you've heard this before. Also, the safety of our older New Yorkers is our top priority in reopening. And any decision on reopening will be guided by um, <laughs> the same, we by the health and safety of us. In saying that, we are working on plans so that as soon as we get 
the word that it's deemed safe to reopen the senior centers, we can then start getting on board and have our senior centers open. We also got the green light to pilot a program that will allow us to re-engage the, the um, providers back into the meal process. So we are hoping to be able to bring these things online soon. And we speak to DOH, MH on a daily basis. We're in constant contact with them. And as soon as we receive that guidance, we will reopen the senior centers. I mean, we have reopened our schools and restaurants are open. There is really no excuse why our senior centers are not open. Uh, really no excuse. And seniors, you know, that's their lifeline. That's where they socialize with their friend. They can utilize the computer, uh, get involved in the program. It will help. I mean, a lot of them have been isolated. Uh, their mental wellness is a very big concern. Um, I just don't understand why just dragging so long, right? Chair Deutsch, I mean, it's like everyone, I mean, the providers are prepared. We just have to make sure they have the resources, but I hope that we yeah. get the center open soon before the summer. Yeah, We're already we, in spring. Uh, we will continue to be guided by the, um, the science. We also want to let you know, we have been, our providers have been engaged with the seniors. We have a full, classes that are online, whether it's um, educational. We know that, we know that they're doing a great job, but we need to send them to the open. If we're waiting for right? science, it won't be for another two years. I know, I mean, we opened that our is, schools, right? Yeah, so, no one wants the centers to be reopened more than us, but we have to wait for the guidance to do that. Vaccination, vaccinations. Yeah. And we I mean, are doing, a huge outreach in order to get as many New Yorkers, including the older ones, adults, we have vaccinations that are going on in our NYCHA senior centers and community centers. We have our CBOs also are set up to be schedulers. We have vaccines set aside for seniors. So we are doing a lot of outreach. We have made thousands of calls, our providers make thousands of calls on a daily basis. So we are doing the outreach and hopefully we will be able to get everyone to get vaccinated. That's our goal and that's what our, one of our priorities are. And we have been pushing that and working on a daily basis to get our seniors vaccinated. So we'll just hope to see our center, you know, open as soon as possible. I mean, the seniors, you know, want those delicious lunch that they miss. <laughs> get food is not good enough. <laughs> Thank you. I'll turn it back to Council Member Deutsch. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, uh, Chair Chen. But I just want, I want, let me, I just want to get this straight. So Department of Aging, when you have, when you have your intake and you identify the seniors, you know which seniors are veterans? You if have that they, I, Yeah, if they self-identify, we know that. Is it on a form? Is it listed on a form? It's part of our intake assessments on okay. our clients. You know so what the number is of how many how many seniors how many senior veterans you have? Right now, about five percent, just over five percent of our seniors um, identify as veterans. You know what number that is? Like what the numbers of how many people? Uh, I don't have that number in front of me, but we can get back to you with that. Five percent of how much? Of how many? Five percent of about I think it's roughly two hundred thousand. We'll get back to you on that. So approximately two hundred thousand. Five percent or approximately two hundred thousand. I don't have that number in front of me, so I don't want to commit it to that. So we'll get back to you on the number and the percentage, but it's 5% of the percentage. 5% of whatever numbers you have. Now, does, yeah. does uh, DVS have those, have those numbers? Or you don't know? Of the, the numbers that the DIP is referring to? Yeah. Um, I believe we can... Um, we may be able to search for, but we would defer to DIP though on what those numbers no, no, are. No, 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 my question is, no, I'm not asking you for the numbers. I'm asking that 
the 5% that Difta just mentioned of veterans, senior veterans, does DVS have that, in, that in same information, have that information of the 5%? Yes, we're, we're aware that the Difta, that 5% of their population of VSS are, are senior veterans. What we'll also add is that- no, no, My question is that you have that information of who those, who those senior veterans are. Who those senior veterans like directly are? No, we we don't have the personal information for that for that five percent pool. Why is that? That's that's what this whole thing's about. That's my question. That's what this whole hearing's about. Well, the the issue would be is that it's it, a veteran. I, I believe there may be a different number of legal implications, but that veteran would have to willingly disclose that information to DIFTA and then add in the extra no, step. That she, if you can she, the assistant commissioner just mentioned that they self-identify. They self-identify to the Department of Aging if they're a veteran. And she just mentioned that 5% of the total number are veterans, senior veterans. Hmm. So my question to you is, do you have those same, those names who uh, Difta just mentioned the 5%, do you, does, does DVS have that, those people in the database as part of your senior veterans? No, they would, there Why may not? be, that's, a of, but I, I think to, to answer your question, Chair, is that, you can tell me it's a legal issue. It's five years into, um, more than five years since DIFTA was, uh, um, the agency was implemented, right? It doesn't take five years to ask a legal question. Sure, but I, I, I would, I would not want to steer you away, Councilman, provide some that would be incorrect. So I, no, I can tell you what that may be and, and why that rationale, that reasoning is, but I would, guess that despite the fact that that veteran is providing the information to DIFTA. So for example, if I said, hey, DIFTA, you can have my information, I think it would be an extra step for me to then say as that as a senior veteran, hey, DIFTA, you can now give this information to DVS for another city agency. And I think that is where the, where the issue may lie. Um, so let me, let's talk about the May, the May, is, um, the May de Blasio issued an executive order. Uh, Executive Order Number 65 on March 8th, which among other things, calls on city agencies to increase outreach to veterans and develop a veteran indicator question on all intake forms. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. Now, what happens when the agencies, um, you know, increase their outreach to veterans and, uh, and veterans reach out to all these agencies? What happens with that information? That information is then maintained by that respective agency and it's provided to DVS, I believe, no later than October 15th of each year. So then, then uh, so all that information comes to DVS? Uh, well, yes, the, the, the information will come to DVS, that, that data to the level instance, but we'll have to- oh, for, to If all the other agencies are supposed to be doing outreach to develop a, uh, a veteran indicator, people to reach out, to these agencies and then that information goes to DVS, right? So why can't DVS get that information from DIF to the 5% that they have? I mean, shouldn't that be part of this whole um, executive order of what the purpose is of this executive order? Well, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to verify, like, you know, those those intricate data points and circle back with you, Chair. But I, I think, once again, what that issue may come about is just that private concern, that second step. You know, if a veteran self-identifies to an agency, there's still that extra step of saying, hey, you can now share my personal information with another agency or throughout the city government experience. And I think I, I would need to circle back on, on what those concerns may be and then obviously provide that to you in the council. Okay. Can you also uh, provide it to Chair Chen when you have that information? Absolutely. Right, right also, I just got uh, numbers from uh, committee staff that in uh, FY 2020, there's 243,000 uh, senior, partici senior participating in the service. And then in FY uh, 21 is uh, 181. So you're talking about 9,000 seniors, uh, senior vet this year and 12,000 last year. So those are the, the information that DIFTA could be given to DVS for you to do outreach to them.
uh, to see if they got all the, the services that they're entitled to. Yeah, I, that, that's I, why, uh, um, Chair Chen, that's why I always say one agency doesn't know what the other agency is doing. I mean, like we have, the, they have the statistics and they have the numbers. So it really would be very helpful uh, to DBS to ha get this information and and really reach out directly to the seniors, uh, veterans. Yeah, no, of course. Uh, you know, our goal at DBS is to, is to be as trans transparent as possible uh, with data sharing. And, and we are still waiting on responses from respective agencies to, to try to, um, uh, obtain that data and work with it. All right, so you'll get back to us. Um, do we know how many uh, veterans may have uh, passed away during COVID? Do we have any of those numbers? If, uh, if any? Uh, we do, Chair. I, well, I, the, the numbers that we can provide to our information is that there have been uh, 255 veterans who have passed away, but that's according to the VA's uh, statistics. So that'll be ones that the VA is tracking as publicly released. Uh, so does DBS doesn't have like a relationship with um, the medical examiner to find out how many how many um, how many from those from that number was resides in here in New York City? Uh, we we can definitely circle back. We do have a relationship with the with the medical examiner. If I recall correctly, on death certificates themselves, usually it's box fifteen is what signifies whether an individual served in the armed forces. And obviously, a you know a survivor will have to check that box off for the deceased. Um, so we can definitely circle back to see. But um, you know, veterans passed away. I think veterans passed away from COVID will be two separate buckets that we'll have to figure out. Yeah, no, because I'm, I'm again. I, I'd like to have. I'd like to see those numbers, but also, um, I don't want you to to do it for me. You know, I, I want you to do it because DBS should have those numbers and. You know, that's why I keep on bringing up it's, a, it's important to get uh, those veterans vaccinated. Yeah, absolutely, sir. We, we understand that completely. And, you know, we're always grateful for those things as well. Now, um, when, when a veteran reaches out to DVS, what is usually the turnaround, um, uh, the timeline of when they reach out to you and when they receive services? So if it's a non-emergency situation, uh, which most of them are council member, uh, typically <clears throat> takes about uh, two to three days, uh, if not sooner, for one of our staff to reach out to them. What's considered an emergency? Uh, if they have a mental health crisis. Uh, that's uh, a 911. Yeah, that would be a 911 call. Yes. Um, okay. So they, okay. Now, you mentioned that uh, if someone reaches out to the Department of Aging, then the Department of Aging would um, reach out to DBS, um, you know, to give up, to give some cases um, to, to, for veterans to receive the services. What is the, the timeline when, from when a veteran, you did say that you, did, you do get calls from the Department of Aging. So when a veteran calls, reaches out to the Department of Aging, and then it comes to DBS, what is the timeline of, that case to, for that veteran to receive services. So, so again, Councilman, if it's not a, uh, an emergency situation- no, I'm uh, talking about emergency is 911. Okay, so typically, you know, no more than two to three days, if not sooner. How do you know that? How do we know that? Yeah, how do you know it's two, three days? So if someone reaches so, out, if a veteran reaches out to DVS, I mean, to, to Department of Aging, it could sit by Department of Aging for two, three days. Oh, you're saying before they referred it to DBS? Yeah, correct. Okay, that that I don't know, Councilman. I, I would I would uh, defer to DIFTA if they have any information no, on no, that. No, so I no, I don't want to defer to DIFTA because I want it's DBS's job to make sure that if someone does reach out to another agency and then it gets referred to the department to DBS, so it's not DIFTA's job. It would be DBS's job to make sure that that those services get expedited. And that, that veteran doesn't have to wait one week, two weeks, one month. Because if, if there is a, um, a, a long turnaround uh, for that veteran to receive services, then there has to be a better system uh, between DBS and other agencies of when they get referrals, when referrals are sent over to DBS. 
So we strive to, uh, absolutely, Councilman. We strive to address our, uh, you know, our assistance requests as soon as we receive them. Um, you know, it, it could be that uh, a phone call is made right, right after the referral is made. Um, yeah, so but, unfortunately, but, yeah, but shouldn't we know how long it takes? Like, if you receive an email from from DIFTA, um, if you would just ask, okay, when did you get this? And then, as DVS, as an agency, your job is to make life easier for the veterans. Right, so you need to think out of the box, right? Not just when you receive that information. I'll give you an example. Someone called my office up. Um, they wanted to apply for, for SNAP. So my staff comes over to me and says, we took care of it. Um, they, they will be approved in 10 days from now. So I asked my staff, and what are they doing? Did you ask them what that family is doing for the next 10 days? Um, then she told me no. So I said, well, let's make the phone call now. Sure enough, there was nothing. They had no food for the next 10 days. So we had to provide them uh, from, from our own pockets, provide them food for those 10 days. Now, if someone reaches out to the Department of Aging and they make a referral to DBS, right? And emergency is 911, but in any other case, you still want to know and analyze and, and it's, it's good information to know of how long that has been sitting with Department of Aging or any other agency. When did that get to you? And then your response is usually you said two, three days. So that information you have already, that if, if so, once you get that information, it's two to three days. But we need to make sure that if there's an issue of that information getting to DVS, how can we do better to make sure that uh, a veteran doesn't have to wait a week or two weeks, depending on how long that information was sitting by another agency, uh, such as Department of Aging. Okay, yeah, I understand your concern now, Council Member, and, and that's something that, uh, you know, we would certainly like to, to capture uh, moving forward, uh, because, uh, you know, it is, it can get discouraging for a veteran when they're reaching out and they're kind of getting bounced around. So I completely understand your concern, and um, that's something that we can work on moving forward. So I think we're going to end it right here, unless uh, Chair Chin has any other questions. No. So I, I want to thank um, uh, DVS. I want to thank Vincent, uh, Amari, and uh, Luella. I hope I got your name right. Um, uh, for testifying, for being here today. So I want to thank you all for all the work you do on behalf of the veterans and our seniors. And I'm going to give Margaret an uh, opportunity to thank you as well. I'm sure she wants to thank everyone before we hear from our next panel. Yeah, just want to yeah thank the, all of you for testifying, and I hope uh, to build stronger relationship between DIFTA and uh, DVS to make sure that our senior and especially our veteran seniors are getting the services they need. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now call on council members. Um, we're going to open it up for a brief question and answer period. So if I'm going to call on council members who have their hand raised oh. and feature in Zoom. Um, if you have any questions, you know, if council members have questions for the administration, now would be the time to raise your hand in Zoom. Um, um, as don't see any hands raised. All right. So we'll move on to our, our last panel. Um, we will now turn to Ryan Graham, Leo Asin, Ruth Stein, Ryan Foley, and Margaret Gimbaro. I'm sorry if I said your last name wrong. Um, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. Again, there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. Uh, please wait for a brief moment. The Sergeant at Arms will announce the start time uh, before you begin your testimony. Again, for council members who have any questions for a particular panelist, uh, please use your uh, raise hand function in Zoom. I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you raise your hand. Okay. I would like to now welcome Ryan Graham to testify. After Ryan Graham, I will be calling on uh, Leo Asin, Thereafter, Ruth Stein, followed by Ryan Foley, and last, Margaret Gimbora. Uh, Ryan Graham, you may begin. Time starts now. All 
Okay, I think Ryan is not on this call. Um, we may come back to him if he pops up back again. So we'll just move on to our next panelist, Leo Asin. Are you available on here? Yes, he is, okay. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairs Deutsch and Chin and members of the Committees on Veterans and Aging. My name is Leo Asin. I am a volunteer and president of AARP New York, representing 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. I'm also a veteran. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to testify today. AARP New York fully supports intro 1616 in order to improve reporting on senior veterans as well as reporting on social services and affordable housing programs for veterans. However, for many veterans, it can be hard to find the right information on benefits and services earned through serving in the military, not to mention any other benefits depending on socioeconomic status. We know accessing benefits is challenging across the board. Having the Department of Veterans Services collect data on inquiries by veterans will help the city understand the actual needs and demand for critical services and help connect veterans to the appropriate agencies who deliver them. It's particularly important that we make every effort to meet the needs of senior veterans right now when older New Yorkers have disproportionately suffered the effects of COVID-19. As the city begins to recover, senior services are crucial to address issues that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, especially with regards to food insecurity, social isolation, healthcare, and other related social services. For these reasons and more, AARP New York fully supports Intro 1616 in order to improve reporting on senior veterans and reporting on social services and affordable housing programs for veterans. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much. Uh, Ruth Stein, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if Ryan Foley from uh, NILAG as well can go before me, please. I'm sorry, you want me to unmute Ryan as well? You're going to be giving testimony oh. together. Sure. Yes, thank yeah. you. Awesome. Time starts yes. now. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, Chair Deutsch, Chair Chen, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to speak about supporting New York City's aging veteran population. My name is Ryan Foley and I am the supervising attorney of the Veterans Practice at New York Legal Assistance Group's Public Benefits Unit and I lead NILAG's council-funded community-based legal services for veterans initiative work. I am joined today by my colleague Ruth Stein, who is a senior staff attorney in our Legal Health Unit's Veterans Initiative, where she staffs our Older Veterans Legal Clinic. I would like to briefly discuss NILAG's work on behalf of veterans, including the impact of COVID-19, before handing it over to Ruth to speak about her clinic and the importance of increased data reporting by the Department of Veterans Services. In 2020, NILAG assisted more than 800 veterans, 53% of whom were age 60 or older. The issues presented by the older veteran population are wide ranging, but often concern essential human needs, such as housing, income, and healthcare, including advanced planning and long-term care. COVID-19 has been devastating for the older veteran population, and we have experienced significant shifts in terms of intake flow and reported legal issues from our older veterans. Early on, it was a struggle to reach and connect to older veterans. Our clients who are used to seeing us in the community at different veteran sites, as well as the VA, suddenly lost that connection. And the technology innovations we use to connect with younger veterans were simply not as effective with the older population. It took the creation of new hotlines, campaigns with our partners to make sure our older veterans knew we were still there at their side. NILAG is grateful to the city of New York for its investment in legal services for veterans, which is critical to the work we do on behalf of the older veteran community. And we are delighted to receive funding from New York City's Department of Veterans Services to assist veterans, including older veterans who require discharge upgrades because they cannot access benefits due to their less than honorable discharges. Still, services for veterans have not been spared from budget cuts and continued and expanded funding for veterans legal Time services expired. must remain a priority. I would now like to turn it over to my colleague, Ruth. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Ruth Stein and I work in legal health, NILAG's medical legal partnership, 
which staffs legal clinics at the Manhattan and Bronx VA medical centers. Due to the instability of private funding resources, we were forced to close our older veterans clinic in July, 2019, and have only recently been able to reopen. This clinic is dedicated specifically to elderly, low-income VA patients whose physical and or mental health issues, which often stem from their military service, are compounded by the impacts of aging. These veterans deal with complex, intersecting legal issues that affect their health. A veteran recently diagnosed with dementia may require advanced planning, but also a pooled trust in anticipation of home care needs and to ensure the rent is paid on time. We may need to fight predatory debt collection to help a veteran to afford essential expenses. <clears throat> a veteran may require help with unexpected interactions between varying government benefits, such as when the onset of Social Security creates a VA pension overpayment. Our older veterans legal clinic works at these intersections in VA benefits, Social Security, housing, family law, consumer issues, and advanced planning, utilizing the expertise of NILAG's 300 plus attorneys, paralegals, and financial counselors to comprehensively address veterans' civil legal needs. Over the past year, which has been especially devastating for the vulnerable veteran community we serve, this ability to maximize resources on behalf of New York City veterans has never been more important. Tracking inquiries by aging veterans for the essential services provided by New York City, from housing to Medicaid to income support, is crucial in examining the full scope of these problems and determining where needs are still not being met. NILAG fully supports Councilmember Valone's bill to amend Local Law 44 of 2019, requiring data on senior veterans to be included in DDS's annual report. It encourages further collaboration between DDS and other NYC agencies serving the veteran population. It is more important than ever I'm to inspired. ensure we are. Thank you. Yep, yeah, yeah, you have. You finished? Oh, you can no, wrap up if I, you want. Yeah, go ahead. You're pretty okay, good. Like, thank you so much. You um, must have been a good student. than ever to ensure that we are meeting the needs of our aging veterans whose military-related disabilities and trauma often place them in a more vulnerable position than the general New York City aging population. And we thank these committees for highlighting this issue and for the continued support of the work NILAG does to help our older veterans. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to engaging in further discussions about serving our veteran communities and improving their access to critical legal services and other resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Stein. I will now call on uh, Margaret Gimbora. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Margaret Gambaro, and I am the manager of access initiatives at Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. In this position, I have the pleasure of planning and conducting the museum's programs for former and current service members and their loved ones. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the generous financial and advisory support of the City Council Committee on Veterans. I want to thank Chair Deutsch and the committee members and staff for your ongoing efforts to connect veterans with one another and with cultural resources like the Intrepid Museum. At the Intrepid Museum, our mission is to promote awareness and understanding of history, science, and service in order to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. The museum has a long history of supporting aging veterans through volunteer services and supporting Intrepid's former crew member association. In 2015, we began military family programs, which not only invited service members to bring their children to the museum, but also older veterans to bring their grandchildren and other family members. Around the same time, we began Intrepid After Hours, which is for current and former server former service members only. The program brings together service members of different branches, ranks, and generation in ways they may not otherwise. We acknowledge that many uh, aging veterans are not as lucky to have loved ones bring them to Intrepid Museum or be able to make the trip. With that in mind, we began vet video chats. Through Vet Video Chat, we virtually connect with veterans facilities, including retirement homes all over the country and bring the museum to them. At the beginning of the pandemic, we knew it was important for the Intrepid, for the museum. Time expired. Our veterans programs. I have two more sentences. Is that okay? 
Sure, go ahead. You okay, cool. Um, it was important for the museum to keep our veterans programs going. We immediately transitioned Intrepid After Hours and Intrepid Book Club to a virtual format. The Intrepid Museum continues to give aging veterans a place to connect with one another and service members of other generations, providing a platform to come together, learn about something new, and share their stories. Thank you. Five sentences, Margaret. Thank you okay. so much. Actually, yeah, I just I want to thank, I just want to make a comment. I want to thank um, the Intrepid every year. Each year we have hundreds, unfortunately, not during the pandemic. We have hundreds of veterans that we have a trip um, going to the Intrepid and they enjoy a beautiful day out there. So I want to give a shout out to Intrepid. And if you haven't been there, you should really uh, um, visit. Thank you, Chair George. We have a last panelist, Steve Palmer. Steve, I'm starting. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Dutch and Chair Chain and fellow city council members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Steve Palmer. I'm 59 years old. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I want to speak to you today about the challenges I experienced after leaving active duty and how I got the help I needed, I needed to live to, to live in New York, nonprofit agency called Project Renew. I began serving my country with the Marines in 1980, right after high school. I quickly achieved the rank of private first class once I completed boot camp. I served as a demolition specialist at a base in California and then as a guard at a nuclear naval weapons station in South Carolina. During my term of service, I was promoted to sergeant and received the Marine Corps Conduct Medal, Good Conduct Medal. But after six years as a Marine, I developed a chronic leg problem and had to be honorably discharged. I had trouble adjusting to society. The Marine Corps was all I had known for my entire adult life. I tried to re-enlist but, but my health issues made it physically impossible. I was depressed, the reckless, and felt like I had been rejected from the only job where I would fit in. I started drinking, using drugs, and ended up in homeless. I spent time in out psychiatrist wards and lost touch with my family. But when I learned about Project Renew, a counselor at a drop-in center told me that it could help me find a place to stay and provide treatment soon after I started living in Project Renew Third Street Men's Shelter. I had been to other shelters, but the facility service at Third Street was better than any I had ever encountered. I received medical, medical and a mental care there, plus substance use treatment abuse program, recovery and outpatient clinics, Within the shelter, I started to live life on my own terms again. While at Third Street, I learned about the Homeless Now program and home, home, one of the project with new permanent housing programs will help people like or on their own in apartments throughout the city. While I continue to provide case managers and counselors and group through the program, I was able to move out of the Third Street and to my own home apartment, Brooklyn. I've now been striving within a home down for over 17 years. Today I'm doing, doing drug-free, alcohol-free, serve and receive on a regular basis, continue to help me navigate the challenges I, I still take to my, I still talk to my psychiatrist every day for, for 24 hours I, if I need her. I'm now in a place where I can get back to people who I'm struggling like I, that struggled like me once I did. After with my church, doing outreach of homeless people, helping them find housing, hot meals, even sometimes getting a haircut. I'm also able to stay connected with my daughter and family and grandchildren. I am truly a blessed to know that I will be there for them while in future time. Take Thanks, Project Renew. I will be 60 years old. Years, 60 years old. I'm still going strong. 
I'm here to support it's important to the 1660, which will help elect officials and general public come to a deeper understanding of the challenges and social safety that various faces veterans is needed. In addition, I'd like to ask the Atlanta City Council to expand funding of veterans like me through an inactive life host homeless program served for veterans with a critical source of support from Party Renew, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Uh, Project Renewal, they do wonderful work and your testimony was really um, something very, in, very, in, uh, very inspired. And I was inspired by just listening to what you went through and, and you're here today testifying um, at the hearing. So I wanna thank you for your service. God bless you, God bless your family and um and uh, your story your story should be told to you know to everyone people should know the obstacles that you went through the challenges you went through as a veteran and where you are today so thank you so much thanks for sharing that story thank you thank you steve that was a really impassioned testimony i will now turn it over to chair george for questions if you have any and chair george if after your questioning, if you want to pass it on along to Chair Chin, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the council members. Yeah, I think I'm good. I just want to thank everyone once again, uh, everyone who joined the panel. Um, and uh, God bless you all. God bless the United States of America. God bless our veterans. And God bless all of those who continue to serve in our military, protecting our wonderful country. And I'll give us over to, uh, to Chair Chin. Thank you. I also wanted to really thank this panel uh, for your great work for our veterans. Um, my husband's having a music lesson with a student. <laughs> uh, I mean, with, I, I'm so glad to hear the testimony from Mr. Palmer that we do have good uh, organization out there that are helping, you know, our veterans and our homeless veterans. And we need more programs like that. Uh, I do have one question for um, okay. Ryan uh, from Nyla. Is your program, uh, Legal Services for Veterans, is that funded by uh, the Department of Veterans Service or by the City Council? Our program is currently funded by City Council. Um, we are working with DVS currently on funding that will be specific to discharge upgrades. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because DVS earlier said that they don't uh, have any contracts with uh, organizations. So hopefully in the future, they'll be able to have more resources so they could, you know, contract organizations like yours and Project Renewals and, and others to uh, provide uh, a service. So Margaret, from the Intrepid Museum, do you also use the public access channel uh, to promote your program? Because not everybody has uh, internet services, right? But they all have, everybody have a, a television set. Uh, so do you utilize the public access channel? Um, so far, no, we do not. Um, right now it is just um, online, but Luckily, we have just reopened. Um, we are open Thursday through Sunday, and we hope to bring back um, our in-person programming as soon as we can. Because yes, we do. And, and Margaret, if you have to go, um, if you have some constituents to want to join, she'll arrange a F-16 to pick you up. <laughs> Great. I mean, my grand, my maternal grandfather was a World War II veteran, and uh, hey, we just fought hard to get, you know, Chinese American veterans recognized um, for their contribution to World War II. So uh, definitely, I'm sure the the local American Legion group would would love to uh, do a visit. So I will uh, contact yeah. you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I guess for for Department of DVS who's still here, uh, Vincent, I see that you're here. That I think the the public access the, uh, the city's public access channel is something that we really should look at utilizing to get information out and also provide programming because 
not everybody have computers or smartphone, but most likely everybody have a television set, uh, the TV. So that's a resource I think we should definitely utilize. Uh, but thank you again uh, to everyone uh, for your service and for coming to testify today. Thank you, Chair Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we're done. Um, so I will open no this up to council questions. Hold on one second, Chair. Sorry, I just want to see if there are any questions. Um, yeah, there doesn't seem like any. So I'll turn it yeah. back to you. Thank you very much. Um, and this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you all.